Motor Week 92, television's automotive magazine, is made possible by funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. Your host from Motor Week 92, John Davis. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week 92. We're glad to have you with us. Long-time Motor Week viewers know this vehicle. It's our favorite workhorse, the Chevrolet Suburban. For six years now, a series of Suburbans have carried the Motor Week crews all over America in search of stories. No other vehicle that we've tried has proven to be roomy, comfortable, or reliable enough to meet our needs. But as much as we love the Suburban, even we have to admit the design is getting a little old. Fortunately, Chevrolet has just introduced a new Suburban. It's a lot different from the vehicle our staff has grown to love. So it's only fair that we let them decide, is the new Suburban good enough to retain their loyalty, or is the love affair over? If it does end, it won't be because we don't like the new Suburban's looks. After a 19-year run of the lovable but very boxy burb, our staff voiced a unanimous, it's about time, when introduced to the 92's sleek new lines. While it's unlikely to be mistaken for anything as small as a blazer, the rounded edges and flush glass placed the Suburban in the same styling family as its smaller relative, which was also redesigned this year. The nose is now smoother with compact headlights. A strong resemblance to Chevy's full-size CK pickup is not surprising since the new Suburban shares the pickup's basic platform. The new chassis allowed Chevy engineers to design a cleaner, roomier interior. To a group that does as much long-distance travel as we do, this is very good news. The CK pickup's modular look dash replaces the old Suburban's pure utility look, and a less workaholic selection of trim materials in our Silverado grade test vehicle makes this a bright, airy environment. The Suburban has always scored well with us on seat comfort, and the new model does too. The front three-passenger bench offers padding and support enough for anyone on our staff. Most of the gang were also happy with the new gauge package. It's very comprehensive, but a few thought that the gauges were too close together, making them hard to read at a glance. The switch gear is all CK pickup. Everything is well marked and easy to see. Heat controls are mounted in the pod for easy reach by the driver. Except for the rocker switch to control temperature, controls are quite effective and efficient. Heat and ventilation for the rear seats can be independently controlled by a convenient roof-mounted switch panel. There's a set up front with the driver and one for the rear seat passengers themselves. The AM FM radio is also located in the dash pod. It has plenty of well-marked buttons. But will someone at Chevy please explain why the cassette player is located way over in the middle of the dash? There were plenty of complaints about that from everyone. All were unanimous in their praise of the roomier, more comfortable rear seat, however, and easier access to the optional third seat was well received. The third seat is now more practical thanks to a footwell that allows tall folks to sit comfortably. It also folds or can be removed completely. With the third seat out and the rear seat down, you get nine more cubic feet of cargo room for 92. The luggage area is a bit narrower, but just wide enough to swallow a four foot wide sheet of plywood. The fancy side panels cover the wheel wells, but also cover space where lots of little things fit in the old burb. On a positive note, folding panels cover the new footwell to maintain a level floor. If you don't like the traditional double rear doors of our test vehicle, you can opt for this new two-piece hatch arrangement. Our staff is looking forward to not having to deal with the motorized rear window of our current Suburban. It's given us a fair amount of trouble. The standard engine for the latest Suburban is GM's 5.7 liter V8. It makes 210 horsepower and 300 pound-feet of torque. A larger 7.4 liter version is optional for those who do heavy towing. But unfortunately for Motor Week's fuel bill, there won't be a more economical diesel in the new Burb for at least two years. Our gasoline-fed Silverado 1500 is EPA rated at 12 city, 16 highway. We average 12 miles per gallon on our mixed test loop. The 5.7 doesn't have the torquey feel that we've come to expect from our beloved diesel, but it's strong enough to turn in a faster zero to 60 time of 12.1 seconds. The quarter mile takes 18.7 seconds at 71 miles per hour. Quite a sprint for such a big vehicle. But while fast, it lacks the diesel's kick down punch, so highway passing isn't as easy. The 
Four-speed automatic makes good use of the engine's power and produces firm, positive shifts. It can be linked to Chevy's InstaTrack four-wheel drive system, which allows you to shift on the move. Unfortunately, some particularly fine November weather prevented us from really testing its capabilities. Blame the greenhouse effect. Stability has always been a hallmark of the Suburban's chassis, and the new platform doesn't let us down. Our test drivers found moderate front plow and lots of stability in corners. Grip is strong for a top heavy utility vehicle and steering feedback plentiful. There was also a lot less body roll than we expected. Fortunately, the new suspension has not destroyed the excellent ride. Actually, our crew found the new Suburban's ride to be much smoother and quieter than previous models. Four wheel ABS has finally arrived on our favorite big truck but thanks to some rather test-worn tires, stops averaged along 170 feet. Stability was excellent, however, and performance improved as our tests progressed. As before, the Chevrolet or GMC brand Suburban delivers a maximum vehicle for the money. You can own one for as little as $18,155. A four-wheel drive Silverado model, like the one we tested, starts at $20,355 cost $27,705 fully loaded. So, after a short deliberation, the MotorWeek staff has decided that the new Chevy Suburban can have a place in our garage any day. We'll miss the superb performance of the old diesel engine, but most facets of the Suburban design are substantially improved, as is, we think, the 1992 Chevrolet Suburban's love affair with us. Purchasing a new car can be a trying experience. But purchasing a used car can be even more exasperating because you don't always know what you're getting. Instead of let the buyer beware, we subscribe to the notion let the buyer be informed. Lisa Barrow has found three services available to consumers that can make a used car purchase easier. Today there are a lot of services to help the auto consumer make better choices. One of those services is called Car Checkers of America. And what they do is they inspect used cars for potential buyers. People that use our service are people that are buying used automobiles and don't want to buy somebody else's problems, whether it be um, at a dealer's lot or at a private individual's home. For a fee of about $75 to $100, Car Checker's mobile unit will drive to the car you want checked out and hook up a diagnostic computer, similar to the ones mechanics use to test more than 3,500 components of the car. The diagnostic tests that we run at Car Checkers of America are engine related. They will check the computer system, the compression system, the emissions, the fuel injection, but we just don't stop at the engine. We use ultrasound equipment on the body to see if it's ever been in a past accident or if there's going to be any rust developing. We have special suspension analyzers to check your suspension and your front end. And we also have a portable wheel alignment machine to check your wheel alignment. It takes about an hour to complete the tests, and at the end, a printout is run, pinpointing any problems. The car checker specialist will also test drive the car and give an estimate on its value. There are also a number of consumer information services that you can reach by simply using your telephone. Here are just a few. This 900 number from Automotive Consumer Services provides wholesale and retail prices of new cars. You can also receive used car prices including exotics, information on insurance and current rebates, and buying tips to determine a good deal and a dealer. All information is available on a hard copy printout. The call will cost about $2.99 for the first minute and $0.89 cents for each additional minute. This information service is called Data Touch, and for a price of $20, will provide you with NHTSA recall and manufacturer service bulletin reports for all domestic and foreign vehicles, including motorcycles and recreational vehicles. Reports can be mailed or faxed to you, and the service is available 24 hours a day. Helpful guidelines on how to work with the manufacturer and car dealership if there is a recall or service bulletin on your vehicle are also included. Or you can call NHTSA's toll-free hotline for safety recall information on any vehicle or child safety seat. In addition, NHTSA receives calls for safety complaints and has experts standing by to answer technical questions. Another service that would have seemed impossible to achieve a few years ago is now a reality. In the comfort of your own home, you can participate in a car auction. Via satellite, using this 39-inch antenna, you can receive the Eckerd Gallery Network. Eckerd carries Cruise Automobile Auctions as well as a weekly one-half-hour program hosted by Dean and Mitchell Cruise on upcoming auctions, events, and tips on successful bidding strategies. Art, antiques, and collectible sales are also broadcast. 
The network isn't cheap and will cost you around $1,300 for installation and a one-year subscription. Each additional year costs $300. If you'd like more information on these services, write to us. Our address is MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. If you're a police officer or just curious about their cars, then Police Cars, A Photographic History will probably appeal to you. This softcover book is light on text, but offers over 800 black and white photos of cars and motorcycles used by U.S. police departments from the early 1900s to the present. Author Monty McCord is a police officer himself and must have worked long, hard hours to assemble such a comprehensive collection. Pat Goss often tells us that cars are his life. Well, this week, Pat helps make life with our cars a little bit brighter. Pat? John, this time I have a letter about headlights. And that letter is from Todd Yushiroda of Kealakakua, Hawaii. Now, Todd wants to know about the differences between the new tungsten halogen bulbs that are used in composite headlamps and the old style of sealed beam lamps. He seems to think that the old style were real easy to change and that the new ones might be difficult. Well, the new ones for most cars are relatively easy to change. Now, what we're talking about here so that we understand what's going on. We're talking about composite headlamps. Now, these are lamps that are designed to blend into the body of the car. They're very aerodynamic in most cases. And instead of replacing the whole assembly when the bulb burns out, you replace a bulb within the unit. Now, in the past, what we had were these sealed beam units. And here, we replaced the entire bulb, the whole thing, the glass front and everything. And in many cases, they were quite complicated as far as the installation was concerned. We had to take chrome parts off of the front of the car. We had to loosen retaining rings and all kinds of things like that. And typically, once we were done, we had to re-aim the headlights. Well, now, with the composite lamps, what we do is very, very simple. And what we're talking about here are lamps that go into the back of these. We can see them right here. Now, what we would see in the car is something like this. Now, most of these are going to have a ring that retains the bulb in the back of the lamp. You turn that ring counterclockwise, and it loosens the bulb. Then you pull the bulb and the ring out of the headlamp assembly. Then what you do is you take the lamp out of the ring, you buy a new assembly, it fits back into the ring, and then the whole thing goes back into the headlamp. Turn it clockwise this time to fasten it in place. Now there's a pitfall here. You have to be very, very careful that you don't touch the glass of one of these bulbs because the oils from your skin can cause the bulb to shatter when it's turned on. So if you inadvertently touch that bulb, what you have to do is you have to use a tissue and alcohol and you wipe the bulb clean with this alcohol on the tissue. That sees to it that the bulb doesn't self-destruct. Okay, real, real easy on most cars. There'll be a few of them, however, that the manufacturers put these wires and things in behind them so they're difficult to get at, but the process is the same on virtually all cars. One other thing that you want to be aware of, you know, bulbs over a period of time lose their intensity. So at least once a year, you want to have a technician check the output of your headlamps to see if they're producing the light that they should. They do that with a light meter such as we have here, and they're either good or they're bad. Now, one other thing that poses a problem as far as composite headlamps are concerned is the aiming of them. See, there are some special things that have to happen because the headlamp isn't flat like it used to be. Well, in order to aim them, if the technician is going to use one of the aiming units that attaches directly to the headlamp, they have to use an adapter, such as we see right here. Now, the thing that throws a lot of technicians is that they don't know that there is a specification that is stamped onto the lens of the headlamp. And it tells them the vertical, up and down, and the horizontal offset. Then this adapter is adjusted to those numbers, and then they adjust the headlamp. And the adjustment in most cases is really simple. There are going to be screws up here at the top that turn, and as they turn, again, they adjust the horizontal and the vertical. Real simple when you know the tricks of these headlamps. 
And if you have a question about your car, if you'd write to me and I select your letter to be used on the air, I'm going to send you a MotorWeek t-shirt. The address is MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Last week, we showed you what's new from Ford for 92. This week, fans of General Motors get a peek at what's rolling off the production lines for the new model year. The core of General Motors' business has always been about the basics, family cars and light trucks. Getting back to and updating those basics in a big way is the GM story this year. General Motors is taking family safety more seriously than ever before with the addition of standard anti-lock brakes on all of its popular modestly priced small cars. That includes volume leaders such as the Chevrolet Cavalier and Pontiac Sunbird. The low-cost Delco-designed ABS-6 system uses tiny motors instead of expensive solenoids to regulate braking pressure. No other car maker will offer more models with standard ABS this year. That includes the redesigned and no longer look-alike N-bodies, the controversially styled Buick Skylark, aggressive Pontiac Grand Am, and sleek Oldsmobile Achieva. The Achieva is a new name, replacing the Cutlass Calais. It is easily the most attractive of the three compacts on the outside, and inside features one of the best cockpit-styled instrument panels yet. Gauges and controls are clear and large. Seats are generous, with an optional adjustable ride control. On the downside, the suspension continues to depend on a solid beam rear axle, and the only automatic transmission is limited to three speeds. In-car power includes a new 8-valve, 120-horsepower version of the Quad 4, dubbed Quad 08C. Besides two Quad 4 options, the top engine choice is a 160-horsepower Buick-engineered 3.3-liter V6. Up the scale to full size, the 1992 front-drive H-bodies have also been completely revamped. Over the summer, the Buick LeSabre, Oldsmobile 88, and Pontiac Bonneville were all introduced. Departing two from most visual similarities, all are powered by 3.8 liter, 170 horsepower V6 engines with electronic four-speed automatic transmission. Only the Bonneville SSEI offers the supercharged 205 horse motor that also powers the 92 Buick Park Avenue Ultra. The SSEI will also be the first GM car to offer a passenger side airbag. While the SSEI offers the most serious tire and suspension combination, optional packages on the LeSabre and 88 provide good grip for the family driver who desires a taste of higher performance. Anti-lock brakes and traction control are available on all three as well. While volume sedans are being revamped, a rebirth is going on at Cadillac. Two models of the Seville and two more Eldorados cover the spectrum of potential Cadillac buyers from import to domestic diehards. The four-door STS compares well to both European and Japanese luxury sports sedans in price, performance, and quality. The Eldorado Coupe is more conservative, using styling and ride qualities that are more easily identifiable as Cadillac. Power for all is from Cadillac's 4.9-liter, 200-horsepower pushrod V8. The much-anticipated 32-valve Northstar V8 will make its first public appearance in the Elante next spring. Changes to other GM cars are numerous, including better fuel economy for Saturn coupes and sedans. The big Chevy, Buick, and Oldsmobile rear-drive wagons get a 5.7-liter V8 for improved trailer towing ability. The Chevrolet Camaro celebrates its 25th anniversary with a special Heritage Edition, while the standard Corvette encroaches on ZR1 territory with a 300-horsepower small-block V8. Traction control is now a Corvette standard, as are Eagle GSC directional tires that provide the best combination of wet and dry street performance yet from Goodyear. GM's light trucks, specifically vans and sport utilities, are in for big changes this year. Front drive APV minivans finally get the 3.8 liter V6 and 4-speed automatic they deserve. A high output 4.3 liter V6 with balance shafts is available on most smaller GM trucks, including the Oldsmobile Bravada. Meanwhile, the ferocious GMC Cyclone Sports pickup gets a turbocharged brother, this Jimmy Bass Typhoon. It storms from 0 to 60 in just 6.5 seconds. Larger sport utility products include the all new full size Chevrolet Blazer and companion GMC Yukon. Standard power is a 210-horse, 5.7-liter V8. Same goes for the all-new Chevy and GMC Suburbans. 
More glass and more car-like features will have to make up for the lack of a thriftier diesel powertrain until at least 1994. Regardless, these giant wagons are likely to be big hits in both two- and four-wheel drive versions. With six new family sedans, two new luxury cars, and a host of redesigned trucks, the story from General Motors is as broad as its product line for 1992. Our car of the week is a 1948 Plymouth police car. It belongs to Mark Morawski of Salamanca, New York. If you have a special car that you'd like to show off, We'll consider it for Car of the Week. Just send a good color photo and a self-addressed return envelope to Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. We all know that Craig Singhaas has a penchant for Fords, but he keeps an open mind about cars from other manufacturers, especially when those cars are vintage Mercedes. He also likes a good schnitzel. Well, recently, we found Craig enjoying a steady diet of both. Welcome to the old country, Germany, with its festive music, beer gardens, and gastronomic delights. To get to this Germany, I didn't have to travel very far, because the festival was held right here in the United States, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Of course, being the automotive enthusiast that I am, I immediately look for the real stars of the event, in this case, one of Germany's most prestigious stars, Mercedes-Benz. Each year, members of the Milwaukee section of the American Mercedes-Benz Club participate in the German Fest by bringing in their vintage beauties, classics that are definite crowd pleasers no matter the age. One walk through the display area and you could have your Christmas list ready. For example, this 190 SL, produced by Daimler-Benz between 1954 and 1963. It, along with the 300 SL, was Benz's first post-war sports car. Powered by a 1.9-liter overhead cam four-cylinder, the 190 SL was intended to be a sports tourer rather than a full-blown sports car. And many of these cars are still around today. Or, speaking of wish lists, you might prefer the 190's successor, the 280 SL, or Pagoda Roof Benz. This one belongs to Frank Coza. Styling took a change to produce more angular, conservative lines, and the 280 was powered by a new bored-out M130 engine that put out 180 horsepower. One of the most historically significant and interesting of the vintage Benzes is the 300 SL. This particular car is owned by Dr. David Yehimiak, who has carefully restored it to its original condition. This is a 1957 300 SL Mercedes Gullwing. Nicknamed the Gullwing, of course, because of the doors. Uh, very significant in Mercedes-Benz history in that uh, the car began as a race car and uh, later turned into this production car. I always loved the car. And eight years ago, I never thought I could afford one. Now I own several. Part of that's due to the fact that I invested in them. Benz made an unprecedented investment into their racing career with this brutal machine, the W196. Unveiled at the 1954 French Grand Prix, the car's radical streamlined design with its wheels enclosed and its 2.5-liter eight-cylinder engine that was placed on its side caught the racing populace's eye. Driven by the famous Juan Manuel Fangio, the car raced in complete contempt of the other 21 competitors. Some say it was clocked at 170 miles per hour blowing by the pits. Fangio won with ease, and Benz had won a top seat in Grand Prix racing history. It was a real treat for festival goers to get this close to one of Benz's best. The W196 rarely leaves the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. And it was a real learning experience for me to get a little taste of Germany right here in America. Join us next time for another new car road test. We'll also have a preview of the Dodge Viper. Pat Goss will be back with more car care tips. And a Motor Week producer makes her debut in a micro stock racer. Plus, we'll have all the latest motor news. I'm John Davis. We'll see you then. Motor Week 92 is made possible by funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you.
If you'd like a transcript of this program, send $4 to MotorWeek Transcripts, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland at 20 cents sales tax. Ask for show number 1111. is a production of Maryland Public Television.